you. We're going to sing really loud in your ears. What? <laughs> I'm so gullible. I was like about to say it. Again. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to sing, going to get through this. We've played like every worship song a thousand times already, so we're going to mix things up tonight. So this is a song Mom wrote. corruption and things that happened. It was a conquering nation that just fell apart from everything evil and no real absolutes to believe in. And, I, and there's a lot of comparisons to our culture and the Roman culture. So here we go, Kyle. <laughs>
mom's gonna play a song called Moving On. And this is gonna kind of go with what she's talking about tonight, if I'm correct. Yes, it's correct. Hope this guitar can take what I just did to it. I, this is not Thanks, my normal. Other guitar. I forgot my other guitar. And this is the For one sure. that I ran over before, so. <laughs> Long that was a day. Long story. Well, we'll talk about it later. But anyway, it still plays. I actually love this guitar, but it hurts when you run over it. So, um, anyway. All right, this song kind of goes along with what we're going to talk about. There's bones in my basement Throwing them out This box Thanks for those of you guys who prayed for my mom this week. She was super, super sick. And I just want to appreciate, say that I appreciate your prayers for her. And um, she is doing better tonight. So I also wanted to say that on our website, if you want to get on um, thebandpascal.com, and if you have prayer requests, um, send them to us so that we can, when we pray together as a band, we can pray for you guys too and the things that you're going through. We'd like to hear from you. On our, it's on our web page or the Pascal Facebook. Which one do we get our mail to, guys? The tech people. Either. Facebook. Either, either one. Either. Facebook page under Pascal, P-A-S-K-E-L, or the band Pascal.com. So communicate with us, especially let us know when you have um, prayer requests and things like that that we can 
include for you. Um, so um, last week we were talking about the holiness, the judgment of God, um, the things we don't mess around with on God. And we talked about the Ten Commandments and how important they were and how important it was to never misuse the name or the words of God. And so um, if you want to catch up with us, we've been going from the beginning of the Bible and now we're clear to numbers. So that's exciting. We're just going through the Bible chronologically. And so, um, and so now we're at some stories where the people of Israel are out in the desert getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. And they built the tabernacle and they've had all their worship and we'll recap on that. But I wanted to say, um, you know, Jesus was asked later on, what's the best commandment since we've been talking in the last few times about commandments? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he basically just summed up the whole Ten Commandments. He didn't say that none of them were important. Remember, the first um, four are about God, and the last <laughs> six are about how we treat people. And so he summed it up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Sums up the whole commandments all in one fell swoop. Pretty amazing that Jesus was able to do that so succinctly. So um, everything that we learn in the Old Testament, we learn for a reason. It all has purpose. So even though some of the same things, some things have changed as the way we live and practice our faith from the, New Test the Old Testament to the New, um, everything in the Old Testament had a reason, had a purpose. And, and some of the stories have a lesson for us. Um, one thing that the people of Israel did... Um, is that they, they had some rules of cleanliness. So in, next to the Ten Commandments are all these rules of cleanliness and how to treat each other and how to treat each other kindly and how to live together. It's just a very raw uh, uh, law book full of human rights. So like I've said many times before, we get our human rights from the Bible. And now um, there have been other books that had human rights in them, like Hammurabi's um, Babylonian Wall had some texts of laws of how to treat people, but they definitely favored the rich people over the poor. And um, the rules of law for the people of Israel was very equalizing and very valuing in human life. And they had a lot of rules for cleansing. And it seems like a lot of little picky things, but it was like, don't touch a dead body. If you touch a dead body, you gotta be cleaned or you gotta be purified. That's Totally amazing, but it's back in these days, people didn't understand about germs and bacteria and all those things. So they said, don't, if you touch things, you have to clean yourself. They had all these cleaning laws, which basically protected them as the people of Israel, protected them from a lot of diseases that wiped out other people. They would follow, the, follow these rules of law. And um, especially when it comes to handling dead things or touching a dead person or being around sick people. And so it's very interesting and I've mentioned this before in one of my microbiology classes in college. They were talking about how people didn't know anything about um, germs in biblical times. And, I, and I, they used the word biblical times, and it really upset me because I'm like, the Jewish people understood more about this just, just because they did what God told them to do than all the people around them. Um, God had some other rules for them, too, related to eating. He said, don't eat pork, don't eat shellfish. Well, I do know for sure that pork, if you don't cook it just right, is full of bacteria that can kill you. So it's interesting that he said, don't eat any pork. And so we can eat pork now. Um, the, in Acts, it changes the laws of eating for the Jewish people and for the Gentiles who came to know Jesus. But, um, but there are a lot of people that practice the old ways of eating, the Jewish ways of eating. In fact, I have a, a really good friend who believes in Jesus as, uh, as their savior, but they practice the feasts of the Jewish people and they practice the, um, the eating. And it's really interesting because one time we went out to dinner together and uh, my husband and I don't drink. So they asked us, um, would you guys mind if we had a, had a glass of wine? And we said, that's fine. And we knew they practiced eating kosher food. So we said, as long as you don't mind if we eat some crap tonight. And they were like, yeah, sure, that's fine. So it was really interesting that night because they brought us like the whole crab and set it in the middle of the table. And my, my friends were just really freaked out because they said, they, you're like eating a spider. 
you know, and they, they had really never seen anyone eat a shellfish. And so we had a great time. It was, it was a funny evening. We've laughed about it since, but it was really interesting because um, uh, they hadn't, they don't eat any shellfish. So they honor the old Jewish laws, probably healthy. Not, that's certainly not going to hurt them. They, I think it's really cool that they take, they do all the feasts of the Old Testament and they definitely celebrate the Passover like we celebrate Easter, they celebrate the actual Jewish Passover. So it's interesting. It's interesting what they what they do. But uh, many of those things came from the old Jewish, the Jewish laws of cleansing, obedience, to remember the Passover. Remember we escaped from Egypt. And so we are just now coming from that where the Passover is new. Like they've only celebrated the Passover the day they left and then the day, the year later. And so... It's not long since the Passover, the second Passover. And so there were, again, all these rules for getting along together. And just to show you how human rights is protected, um, in Exodus 20, 22, it says, if two men are fighting and one of them accidentally strikes a pregnant woman so that she gives birth, um, birth prematurely, and it goes on to say, if no harm is done, the person who, was, who hit her has to pay a fine. Even if the baby's okay the, um, and no harm is done, they still have to pay a fine. Whatever the husband says has to be paid. And then it says further, if further damage is done, uh, the consequences change. A life for a life, an eye for an eye, a, two, you know, a, a hand for a hand. And it goes on to say, punishment must fit the crime. So that's where we get that. So when people, um, if we um, practice this nowadays, I bet there'd be a lot less crime happening. But that's what it was in the Old Testament. If you hurt somebody, you had to pay. If you killed somebody on purpose, they had they definitely separated accidental death from purposeful death. But in these days, if you hurt someone, if you killed someone on purpose, they killed you. They did not mess around. It was very clear capital punishment, which is where all, a lot of the views of capital punishment came from. Um, so, also, they were very clear about rules of immorality, and, in, and for these people, marriage and sex and procreation was a very sacred thing. They did not play around with it at all. It was very sacred for marriage, for procreation, for, um, um, for the holy people of God. So, they had very clear rules about morality. And they did not allow for people to sleep together before they were married, because then they would be tainted and unclean. And they did not allow for people to be to commit adultery. In fact, adultery, proven adultery, was punishable by death and stoning. And these days, they did not mess around with things like that. That's very serious. And so um, there is even a law that said if a man uh, took advantage of a girl who was not married, so she would have been a pure girl, then he had to marry her. He had to give, it doesn't say that she, she was pregnant, it says he just had to marry her and pay the total bride price. And it said, here's this really nice and interesting thing. Um, uh, well, what if the girl didn't want to marry her? What if he took unwanted advantage or whatever? It protects her because it said the father, if the father doesn't want the girl to marry this man, he can say no but they still have to pay the bride price. So it's interesting that the God really protects his people. And, um, and even in this case, protects the girl. She could run to her dad and say, I don't want to marry that creep. And he'd say, fine. And then say, give me the money, but I'm keeping the girl. So I think there's some really interesting things in the Old Testament that we could actually learn from about protecting people and protecting people's rights and our society really struggles with things like this because we don't consider things sacred. We don't consider some lives sacred. And like we're getting really, we're getting better on unborn babies, but we're still fighting this battle in court about um, if a baby has a right to a life. And obviously here by the text in the Old Testament, it's clear the unborn baby is a human being just like another human being. So it's interesting. And these people did not mess around um, with these things because it was very clear to God that he had to preserve this holy people and a holy nation. And so he was much more critical on the things that, um, that he was trying to make them a separate people. 
And um, for every nation, it's interesting that God loves people. He really does. He hates human sacrifice. He definitely hates it when people kill babies. And killing babies has been part of human sacrifices by a number of cultures, including Carthage, um, which were the Phoenician people, and um, Hannibal, that great general that almost took over Rome. His people practiced child sacrifice, proven um, archaeologically. And even though he was a brilliant, brilliant general, he was, I, I believe that God did not allow him to defeat the Romans. In fact, the Romans went over there and burned his, the whole place, tore down the whole place, put salt in the fields and ruined them. And um, they call it the Punic Wars, but that's where we get the word punitive. They not only conquered them, they punished them. So it's interesting that God does not abide a nation that hurts children. It just, he doesn't, he, the blood of the, of the innocent, the Bible says, cries up from the ground and he will take care of business. We talked about that. So, um, as a nation, we have to be careful what we make legal because we, um, we're going to account for what's, the blood will be on our hands. And God definitely values human life. He definitely values it. So if we just start throwing people away because they're in the way or inconvenient or whatever, we're going to answer to God. That's just how it is. We're going to answer to him. And it's not going to be pretty because he loves people. So, um, again, every nation that's ever practiced human sacrifice is no longer a nation. Um, so whether or not you consider abortion a human sacrifice or not, I certainly do. And I think that we're, we're going to account for that. But there's a lot of good people in this country, you know, fighting the rights of people, of everyone, of the oppressed, of every color, against racism, of all these things. That if we're Christians, we fight for the rights of people. Um, also, again, we went over the practice of worship of sacrifice and the importance of sacrificing for sin. And um, remember, they built the tabernacle and had the Holy of Holies, and only the priest who was consecrated could go into the Holy of Holies and talk to God, who was between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. And they had to talk to God and then bring the message out to the people. And, and I talked about how now we don't have to do that because the curtain was torn and Jesus talked straight to us. That's really awesome. He comes straight to us. Um, as far as the Ark of the Covenant, you know, everybody asks, like, where is the Ark of the Covenant, you know? And Raiders of the Light, Raw Lost Ark is a, a fictional movie, okay, but it's about a real thing. And I happen to think there's some evidence that the Ark of the Covenant was actually carried down to um, Ethiopia when um, one of the kings was being, um, was, was conquered by Assyria and playing with Assyria and giving them homage and paying them money that the priest took the ark away because they knew Assyria was coming and they did come and conquer um, them later, but that they took the ark away and Babylonia later conquered all of Jerusalem. But at some point when the Assyrians are a threat, there's some thinking that the, Babel, that the ark was moved and hidden in Ethiopia. And interestingly enough, there's a group of... Um, of Jews who are Ethiopian in skin color and everything, and they practice perfect Judaism to this day. And they have a little place. They think some people think that's where the ark is hid, hidden and covered, that it was taken down to Africa and hidden away in Ethiopia. So interesting. I don't know where the ark is, but um, it would be cool to see it. I mean, I mean, who wouldn't like that? So anyway, as far as that, the people are continuing their practices in the tabernacle. They're moving, they're following the cloud, they're following the pillar of the fire. And eventually, God leads them to the land of promise. And, he, and so they, Moses sends out some spies. Let's go look at this land that God wants us to take, wants us to conquer. And so they, 12 spies go out. Two of them are Joshua and Caleb. That's why you know those names, one of the reasons. And they come back, and they come back, and they said that they had some grapes, and the grapes were so heavy that they carried them on a branch between two men, and the grapes were like falling on the ground. They're so lush. The land was called the land of milk and honey. That's where we get that statement. The land was full of milk and honey. So they brought back these huge grapes and all this fruit, and um, it was amazing. And Joshua and Caleb were like, this land is beautiful. Let's go and take it. This is the land that God has for us. 
let's go take the land. And then the 10 other spies said, no, the people are huge. Their cities are big. They all have fortresses. And then the people are giant. They make us look like grasshoppers. Really, that's what the Bible says that they said. They were exaggerating. They were like, we look like grasshoppers compared to these people. There's no way we can take this land. There's, it's just not going to happen. And then it says in the Bible, in the scriptures, and this is in Numbers 13, that they cried all night long about it. They cried all night long. And then they started to stir up into a mutiny. And um, they planned to stone Joshua and Caleb. So they cried all night long and caused this big mutiny. And then they said, we're going to kill Joshua and Caleb. Because Joshua and Caleb were like, let's go do it. Go to the land that God has promised. And they had perfect faith. And they were like, let's go do it. And they're like, we got to get rid of these guys. So not only are they being disobedient to God, they're now planning a death for the people that are like, we're leaving you, let's go. And so um, Moses and God are so angry with them. And they're just really, God's like, I'm just going to wipe these people out there. They're terrible. They will never listen to me. It doesn't matter what I've done to them. I took them through the Red Sea. I took them out of Egypt and the 10 plagues. And I have watered out of the rock. And I fed them manna from heaven. I fed them. I've done everything. It's never enough for these people. He's very angry. And Moses pleads for them. Well, but these are the people that are bringing the coming, the coming blessing. So Moses knows that these people are special and that they have a plan. And he's like, don't. Don't kill all the people, just any pleads for them. And so God just says, turn them, up, turn them around and take them back to the desert. And they were there for 40 years in the desert. That was their judgment. And he said, this is really interesting. He said, anybody over 20, 20 or over, is never going to go into the promised land. That was his judgment. If you're over 20, you are a definitely willing participant in being disobedient. If you're under 20, you can go to the promised land. So he took them out in the desert, and they wandered around and, and practiced their religion and everything for 40 years until all of those people were dead, except for <coughs> the children, the people under 20, and Joshua and Caleb. They got to go into the new land. And so we'll talk more about that later. Moses didn't go into the new land. He stayed. He didn't get to go. But Joshua and Caleb and all the, all the children got to go into the land. So, um, and some of them were definitely more than adults by the time the 40 years got up. But God got rid of all of the adults. And here's what's really interesting about that. They were saying when they were complaining, we want to go back to Egypt. And, and during that mutiny, they were saying, we, let's pick a leader to take us back to Egypt. So here they were slaves. They were slaves, and then God freed them, and they, he took care of them, and they still couldn't get the Egypt slavery out of their mind. They just couldn't give it up. And I think this is a, a lesson to us, that sometimes when we come out of the life of sin and a life of slavery, why is it that we just keep wanting to go back to it? We just can't, like, let go of it and move on. And um, the Bible says in Proverbs 26, 11, like a dog returns to its vomit, so is a fool who returns to his folly. And I think being slaves in that land of Egypt for 400 years had so altered their thinking that they just couldn't let go and trust God. They just couldn't do it. They kept going back to Egypt. Every time they complained when they ran out of water, every time they complained when they ran out of food, it was always, let's go back to Egypt. And they forgot that when they were in Egypt and they were slaves, they were crying out for God's mercy. He heard their cry and delivered them. And then from then on, all they ever wanted to do was go back to Egypt. Every time, at least amount of trouble and this wasn't even trouble it was just like we got to get ready to take the land they're like no we want to go back to Egypt in fact you should be quiet or we're going to stone you 
They couldn't get it out of their head. They were just like a dog going to its vomit. I know that's a terrible, terrible example from the Bible. When I've used it before on my team group, they're like, don't say that. And I'm like, you know, that's how it is. If you have a bad habit, you did something wrong, you walk away. But if you keep going back to it, you're like a dog going back to vomit. It's just pathetic. And the Bible says that's what a fool does, keep returning to the folly. And so I think it's really hard. I'm not undermining anything. We've all had the things we've struggled the most with. It could be our past. It could, be have, it could have something to do with no, nothing that we've ever done ourselves. It could be alcohol. It could be drugs. You know, there are people that watch this show that have overcome out, lots of things. And they're overcoming through Jesus Christ because none of it can we do on our own. But they know not to go back. And they know to let go and to move on. And it's hard. It's not easy. Sometimes the things that happen in our past even though they're painful, even though maybe we didn't even do it, they're like something, a place that we're familiar with, feeling these terrible feelings or torturing ourselves or, or trying to please people all the time or all the, the bad habits that we've accumulated, um, even some of them well-meaning. If we don't learn to let go of them, we will always be a slave. And so that's what happened to the people of Israel. They were slaves. God set them free, but they were always slaves in their mind. They were still slaves. And they were like, take us back to Egypt. Take us back to serve the Egyptians. And they'd say that, take us back so we can serve the Egyptians. They, they, were, they could not get past being slaves. And so God had to just say, okay, we're going to, we got to start over with these people. And he cleared them out over time. And I believe if this sounds really harsh, but I believe it was an act of mercy. He didn't kill them all at once. He just said we're going to live in the desert and we're going to learn how to trust God while we're in the desert. And then how many of us has God brought us to the promised land? Brought us and said this is what you're going to do and, and we're just like, ah, I don't know. And how many times do we just walk around in the desert because we're just afraid to go over there, you know? How many times do we walk in the desert because we're just afraid to obey God? And we live in the desert for a really long time. And I think a lot of people, probably every person in the Christian walk has probably taken a little desert cruise, right? Taken a little cruise through the desert of annihilation and emptiness and whatever. And sometimes it's made them go, oh yes, okay, I am ready to get out of this desert. But sometimes people, once they get in that desert, they just stay there. They're like, we like the desert. It's cool. I hate the desert. I just, trees, give me trees, give me water. I don't really love the desert. But, you know, people get comfortable with what they're used to. These people were comfortable with slavery. They couldn't get comfortable with God. And so they didn't get to go to the promised land. And I guess it comes down to how willing are we to submit to God and to trust Him? How willing are we to submit to God? Because we can serve Him in the little tabernacle and the Holy of Holies as long as we stay in the desert and don't move on to the new land. But how, what are we missing from God because we just don't let go of our bondage? And I'm talking to myself here. You know, I have things that I've struggled with my whole life from my past and I just have to Learn to not live in that bondage and just, I'm free to be able to say, I'm free and to be able to trust God. And I think if you've been through things that have hurt you, it's really hard to trust God and probably to trust people. But the most important thing, not all people are trustworthy, but God is. And in order to walk in the, in the milk and honey and the promised land, we have to submit to God and say, okay, I'm going. I'm scared. I don't know. This is a new thing. But I'm going with God. I will trust you. And this, this last week, you know, there's a lot happening in my life. And it's easy to just sow the seeds of doubt, you know, and to be able to say, okay, God, I surrender. I don't understand this. I don't know where we're going. But I will trust you because you are God. You're the creator, 
You have saved me a thousand times. You have um, done amazing miracles in my life. And so even though I have no idea how to deal with this next thing, I'll trust you. That's not easy to do. That's really not. Because all of us are raised, especially now in a society where I must have control. I must have control of my life. And that's where the Israelites were. They were like, I want control of my life. I can't trust God to go there, so I'm going to have control. I'm going to stay in the desert. I want to go back to Egypt. That's it. Those are my alternatives. I'm not going forward. I will take control. I will be in the desert. I will annihilate anyone who tells me otherwise, and I will stay here, or I'll go back to Egypt. And so it's a challenge to be able to ask yourself, have you given up control? Which is not easy to do. To be conformed to the image of Christ. And again, remember, this whole thing, the whole Old Testament happened as a preparation for the Christ to come to redeem us, which we talked a lot about last time. So this whole, this people, everything they're doing, everything they're celebrating, everything they do has a foreshadowing of the coming Christ who will redeem them. Everything is a preview of what's happening later. And so like all the things that happened with Moses, we compare it to all the things that happened with the coming of Christ. Very, really similar. The prophecies. There are so many prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. It's unbelievable. I was reading today that for one man to have made himself fulfill the prophecies is like um, the number of 1.17 times 10, it's, or it's like 1 times 10 to the 117th power that any one person could have filled, fulfilled all of the prophecies about Jesus, starting back with Adam and Eve and Moses and, and Abraham. So God has provided for us. And so when we're afraid, when we want to take control, we have to realize that if we take control, we're in bondage or we're in the desert. We're never going to be free. So to give up control means you have to trust God. And only then can you move into the promised land. Only then can you move into the promised land. Now the promised land isn't going to be just totally milk and honey all the time. These people had to fight major battles before they gained their own land that was promised to them. But they had to trust God to do it. And so, again, Jesus Christ has provided for you forgiveness, but he wants to be the master of your soul. And you have to trust him. And he wants to lead you on to the promised land. But if you can't trust him, you're going to be in the desert or back in Egypt in slavery. So you got to choose to say, I will go. I will go with Joshua and Caleb. I'm not staying here. And I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, people have fought terrible things. Addiction is a terrible thing. It's so hard to overcome anything like that. But I have seen God work through people, and I have seen him conquer addiction. And I have heard testimonies from people. And, and, and in my life, the things that he's done for me are, is a testimony that God is bigger than these things. But if we don't trust him and we don't surrender, we're just stuck in the desert. And so that's, that's all I have to say tonight. And it's been a hard week. We've had some tough things going on. And, but I'm trusting, I'm trusting Jesus. I'm trusting him. And, and I'll trust no matter what. I'm going to trust him. I choose to trust him. And, some, and everything that he allows to come into my life and into yours, if you will let him, will conform you into the image of Christ. And make you what you were really made to be to begin with. And that, like I said, not easy thing, but it's a free gift it's to say, yes, I will submit. I will submit to the will of God. Like Jesus had to submit before he went to the cross. I will submit to the will of God. And so um, with that, I'm going to say a short prayer, and then Casey's just going to do an acapella song. And um, I love this song that she does the way that she does it, and it kind of speaks to the end of the story. 
for us in this, what I've just told you. And so let's pray, and then I'll have Casey come and sing. So Heavenly Father, we just love you, and thank you that you've provided us freedom instead of slavery, and that you've provided us milk and honey instead of a desert. And even though we face really hard times, God, we will say yes, and we will move forward, and we will trust you. And we just say thank you for salvation. Thank you for a son that redeems us. Thank you for the power to move forward from the garbage of our own lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Where to stand in the morning And who's all the oceans You can only go this far And who showed the moon Where to hide till Who That hold me when I'm broke. 